uh, presentation of, uh, of the day. I'm pleased to have Dr. Pasquale Patrizio here with us. Um, he is a professor in the Department of uh, uh, GYN, OBGYN, and also the director of the Yale uh, Fertility Center. Uh, he and I met a few months ago. We talked about the uh, huge opportunity that exists here at Smilo to capture a, a higher number of patients who are at risk for fertility issues. Um, Dr. Uh, Patrizio will be actually seeing patients here at Smilo on NP1. I believe this is in the late yes. stages of, uh, of planning. The planning. And so um, we're looking forward to his presentation in terms of how his work can um, interact with the work that we do for hematology and oncology patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Miramal. So quickly, three, three disclosure. One is that I'm the advisory board for Council. It's a genetic company. The second is I'm a co-founder and medical advisor of Fertile Safe. And the third is not listed, that is that I have an accent uh, for the duration of the talk. Uh, I'm Italian from Napoli. And uh, these are the three topics I want to touch upon with you. And like Dr. Lillenbaum said, we are really trying to establish a stronger uh, relationship with the, with the SMILO, we as a reproductive endocrinologists, because uh, the fertility preservation uh, is becoming more and more of a, a, an important concern uh, now that uh, cancer uh, patients are surviving. Therefore, quality of life is becoming an important paradigm for uh, um, having the opportunity to completely forget about the fact that they had cancer in their reproductive years and they can go on and have their own normal uh, family. If they could not, that will be always a stigma. They will remember all their life that because of they, they are cancer survivors, they cannot have babies. So what about the epidemiology? How many patients we think uh, exist in the United States that every year can be affected by uh, cancer in the reproductive uh, years, probably about uh, 55,000 per year, and we uh, put the, the limit at uh, age 35, but uh, we can, if we add this to 40, these numbers can be certainly more, more robust. And these are the type of cancers that are more frequently encountered in uh, women of reproductive age. The most common one it's the breast cancer, and in fact, the estimate is about 40,000 a year in women of reproductive age. And then to this, we also had to add other potential patients that can be interested in fertility preservations. And these are patients that are uh, impacted by non-cancer medical conditions. And all those that have a bone marrow transplant, uh, for example, they have a sickle cell anemia, there are autoimmune conditions. And if you see for uh, uh, the non-malignant malignant conditions, uh, the uh, major thalassemia, another one, a plastic anemia, and all the group of autoimmune disease. And those, uh, we are also offering the service of fertility preservation to patients that are at risk for premature ovarian insufficiency, so early turning elderly into menopause. And those are uh, patients that have a Turner syndrome uh, with, the, with the mosaic karyotype, recurrent endometriosis, therefore the ovary is going to be completely um, uh, halved in size or sometimes one ovary completely removed. So we are also offering uh, uh, fertility preservation to this type of patients. And then for completeness, I also want to tell you that uh, uh, also with the indications of our American Society of Reproductive Medicine, we are also offering, and we have done already two cases here a year, uh, fertility preservation for uh, um, for uh, uh, transgender uh, body modification. A boy that wants to become a girl or a girl that wants to become a boy, they can preserve their gametes before they undergo these radical uh, transformations. Now, um, in terms of uh, why would we focus on a hematopoietic stem cell transplant? Well, because if you see that uh, the rate of ovarian failure uh, after exposure to uh, these uh, various chemotherapy agents is pretty high, so it is really a good idea to, to offer the service. And so we are also now starting to address uh, pediatric uh, uh, survivors of cancer, and because even at that point, maybe we can do something for preserving their, their ovarian tissue. And also the men, we don't forget about the men, we have a, also a very active service of uh, fertility preservation for males 
and uh, the, the collection of sperm most of the time is pretty un uneventful and uh, not so complex like can be with the, uh, with, with, with the uh, female. Now why we, we talk about this, as I, I mentioned earlier, is because the survival is uh, dramatically improved. You see that for Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, almost 90% of patients that are successfully treated by you, they, uh, they survive and therefore they are looking now to move on and have their own family. And uh, I wish, with your help, to come up with a, a recipe where saying that, okay, this particular cocktail of drugs or, or radiation dosages is going to be automatically or unequivocally providing uh, uh, premature ovary insufficiency, but unfortunately it's not like that. So the same patients, the same diagnosis, the same chemotherapy protocol, some they become menopausal after the treatment and some they don't. However, if, even if they don't, we still want to do pre fertility preservation because one thing that is uh, certain is that uh, if they recover the menstrual secrecy, that the menstrual secrecy after recovery is not going to last as long as if they had not been treated by chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Therefore, the window of opportunity for reproduction becomes much shorter, much uh, uh, tight, and therefore we still want to see them and give this, this type of information. As you can see here, the, the time of age at uh, diagnosis and time of menopause, the probability of menopause is much higher when uh, uh, there is chemotherapy and uh, uh, radiotherapy together for patients with the breast cancer. You see they become menopausal much earlier than if they did have only one or none of the two. So because we don't have that magic recipe of ingredients, we have to classify uh, patients at uh, high risk, intermediate risk, low risk, or very low risk according to what we know today about the gonadotoxic insults of uh, the uh, gonadotoxicity of the chemotherapy. And uh, this is a, uh, these are two publications that uh, we, we, we did the first one in 2006 when we established the guidelines for fertility preservation. And I have to admit that before 2006, the referral for fertility preservation and fertility preservation as a, a subspecialty of the subspecialty started to be available since 2000. We were seeing very, very, very few uh, referrals, really, really few. But then after 2006, we started to see a surge and that was in, co in the concomitancy uh, uh, of the publication in the, of the ASCO uh, paper for the guidelines. And now in 2013, those guidelines have been uh, uh, also updated. So the high risk are patients that are receiving cyclophosphamide, procarbazine, intermediate risk cisplatin and adriamycin uh, basis uh, chem chemotherapy uh, protocols. And those in green are uh, those with the low risk. And there is also a group that we really don't know yet. We don't have enough data to say how much, especially for colon cancer patients, that they take uh, irinotecan or xaliplatin, how much of this is going to impact their reproductive function. And these are the guidelines, as I, I, I mentioned to you. If you are interested, I can provide you with the copies of, of this uh, um, uh, paper. And these were uh, the latest uh, uh, guidelines that we published in uh, um, just to take home the point that, you know, it is really important not only to talk with uh, breast cancer but also with the lymphoma and leukemia because these are the most common, most uh, frequent cancer in uh, women of reproductive age. All right. So, despite the guidelines, despite I go probably seven, eight times a year doing outreach program locally and uh, uh, not too far from New, uh, uh, from, uh, New Haven. I do these talks, but still, despite information available in uh, literature, despite us doing a lot of uh, outreach activity, we still see that uh, there are not sufficient number of referrals. And, uh, and we are trying to struggle, okay, why is this, uh, uh, is this not happening? Why we are not seeing the p patients that are seen, for example, here? And I'll show you um, in this in this uh, slide that uh, uh, Cindy Duke, that is our third year fellow in reproductive medicine, she took uh, this project last year, and what she did, 
she did an audit of all the dispensary for cyclophosphamide done here, eh, here at Yale, and uh, between uh, July 2013 and 2014, she identified 199 orders that were placed for 54 patients in this age group, okay, 12 to 41. And of these 54 patients, only 9% were referred for fertility preservation, and of this, 80% uh, of this referral where, okay, I have to start cyclophosphamide in two days, so see what you can do in 48 hours, which is not really too much, too much of opportunity for us. And 91% of these charts that she reviewed had no documentation, no documentation that fertility preservation was even discussed or, or, or was offered to these patients. So, and that's what was the trigger for, uh, for me and, and, and my colleagues to say, you know what, I need to talk to Dr. Linenbaum, I need to, at the time I had to talk also with, the, with the Tom Lynch and the Dr. Herbst and say we need to do something and we need to try to capture, at least here, I mean, it, it's really absurd. We have a fantastic center, we think we have a, a great center for fertility preservation and we are not doing a good job in, uh, in capturing the, the patient population that is really important to receive this type of, of a service. So we came up with the, with the little brochure, uh, originally called Yes. I have some, uh, some samples with me if you, wanna, if you want it. Some has, has made me to notice that perhaps uh, Yes, it's not a very nice way of uh, uh, commercializing or uh, informing the community that we have a fertility preservation program because someone says, oh, this Yes may, may mean Yes, you have a cancer. No, for me it's Yes, you can preserve Ye yes, you can preserve fertility after the cancer. We may change the yes in YFPP, Yale Fertility Preservation Program, which is a little bit less, to me, catchy than uh, Yale Egg and Sperm uh, Saving Program. <laughs> but we, we do have the service, and uh, uh, me and Ryan Martin are the two uh, physicians that see patients within 48 hours. From the moment that you make a referral, 48 hours, within 48 hours, the patient is seen. Now, uh, the team, is uh, obviously collaboration with you, absolutely. It has to be a very strong relationship. Then uh, uh, a reproductive endocrinologist expert in fertility preservation. We need to have a nurse that is the coordinating of care. We have a social worker available for counseling. And then a laboratory technician or embryologist that is an expert in how to freeze eggs, embryos, ovarian tissue, testicular tissue, and sperm. And we do have all of them uh, available. Now, in terms of the steps, the oncologist starts a referral. We see the patients within 48 hours max. And then uh, when we see the patient, we start to make uh, plans for the fertility preservation depending on that particular case. And now we give you the options in the next few slides. But then uh, that has to be communicated to you because you have to be on board with the whatever plans we are trying to put together. And that on board means, is it okay if we, if we take uh, 10 days or two weeks max? from your scheduled uh, protocol uh, that, you, that you want to do for that patient. Is it okay for this patient to take these particular medications and the estrogen level may reach a, a 1,500 uh, um, picogram as a, as a threshold and so forth? Then uh, the patient, after she is seen by, by one of us, we make the plan, the same session has to talk with the financial. And here, if uh, most of the time, unfortunately, insurance don't cover for the service of fertility preservation, still considered experimental, and we are trying to fight it here in Connecticut. There is a bill that hopefully uh, by New Year should be passed that we, have, we must have uh, uh, coverage for this. And, um, and if not, we have a, a number of uh, programs that offer assistance. Some are uh, driven by uh, pharmaceutical industry like Fairing, for example, uh, EMD Serono, and some other just patient organization. One is the stupid, stupid uh, uh, cancer dot, uh, um, org, or uh, uh, the Yellow Umbrella, or the Lance, Lance Armstrong Foundation when he was not yet in trouble for cheating while, while he was biking uh, uh, in France. Um, and then we have an RN that is going to be teaching what we want to do uh, so that's teaching the protocols and how many times that patient has to be seen for having uh, an egg harvest for uh, egg freezing or embryo, embryo freezing. Max in two to three weeks from the time that you refer a patient to us, the time that we give back the patient to you because uh, she has uh, already done a, a, a treatment plan, 
two to three weeks max. So it's not like in the old days, you need six to eight weeks. Now in two to three weeks, we can do this. What are the options? The options are the one in, uh, in, uh, in uh, bold, or side freezing, embryo freezing, ovarian tissue freezing, and then we are doing some research on how to we can make in vitro eggs or how we can uh, perfuse an entire ovary. But these are the three mainstream opportunities. Be it the embryo freezing and oocyte freezing are the most common one. What do we need for egg freezing? And to, to whom do we offer that? Well, if the patient is single, obviously there is no, no male gamete available, so we have to freeze the eggs. They need to be younger than 41, sorry, 40. No, oh, they, they, they have objection to embryo freezing. They may be in a relationship, and sometimes they feel uncomfortable to freeze embryos because they say, you know what, I really don't know what's going to happen to me. I, I feel that if I freeze an embryo, then I feel guilty if I'm not going to use it. I don't know if I'm going to be here. So they are really very much into, in tune, and they say, okay, I just want to freeze eggs. It's not so much moral responsibility by doing that. And as I said earlier, two weeks, I need to have no contraindication to hormonal stimulation. And again, please, prior to starting, uh, uh, prior to starting chemotherapy, not after the process has already started, because the damage to the gonads and to the uh, oocyte may already been uh, happening. How many cases have we done here so far? We have done uh, uh, 43 egg freezing cases. We have about 410 uh, uh, now in the bank. And these are, as I said earlier, breast cancer being the most common one. So these are the type of patients that we have frozen eggs. You can see some, they also passed. Eh? So we have a consent where we go through on what you want us to do in the event that we are not so lucky and, or you are not so lucky and you are not going to win your battle with the cancer. And so they give us uh, what to do, with how to dispose of their eggs. If there is a, a, um, a request for, okay, what's the success rate for egg freezing? The truth is that we have all the eggs still in the liquid nitrogen. We have not used yet egg. But the worldwide literature shows that there are 10 babies born as of 2014 for egg frozen in cancer patients. Okay? These are, this is the, the most uh, updated uh, paper. What about embryo? We can do embryo if there is a partner that, and the, the married or not married, it doesn't matter, as long as uh, the patient is understanding that the consent is a little bit different in the case because we have now an, another person that is going to be signing on, on the paper what to do in the event of a uh, uh, patient not surviving the cancer. We freeze embryos at different stage of development, but today, these are just to show you when I say, oh, an egg has been frozen the day after egg collection. Okay, so that's pronuclear freezing. Oh, the, the embryo has been frozen three days of growth. That's cleavage stage embryo freezing. Or the embryo has been frozen five days after in vitro culture. That's called the blastocyst. That's a blastocyst, more than 100 cells. And today we are preferring this as a stage of, uh, of uh, freezing. Now, this is important to show to you this because sometimes patients say, oh, but Dr. Patrizio, we got 10 eggs, we got eight pronuclear embryos, we got seven that made it to day three, and then I only, got up, I only end up with one or two embryos to freeze. What happened? Well, that's normal physiological attrition. There is a lot of uh, biological waste, even in completely normal patients. So we have to explain. And, and for us, it's better to freeze at the blastocyst stage, where you know that the embryo has been able to bypass all the growth, at least the first five days of growth in vitro, then not to freeze at 2 p.m. Because if I freeze at 2 p.m., I would have frozen, let's say, eight embryos. But then in reality, probably only one or two will make it to day five. I have frozen six potential illusions. And the patient may think, oh, I'm OK. I already have eight embryos. I'm, I don't need to do another cycle. Or I can wait for reproduction. So it's important to give as close as possible to the reality uh, information possible. For breast cancer, the protocol that is currently used is uh, Femara, letrozole, plus FSH, plus a generation antagonist with the intent of keeping the level of estradiol during the stimulation, 10 days of stimulation, 
no more than 1,000 to 1,200 uh, uh, picograms per, per ml. So that's the, the protocol that we are using. And you see that uh, whether you start uh, the chemotherapy, sorry, wh whether you start the fertility preservation before or after, before or after surgical resection of breast cancer, it really doesn't make too much of a difference. There is a difference if I start after chemotherapy has started, but not if, you, if, you, if there is a patient that has need to have a resection. Um, so she can go ahead and have a resection, but then before chemo, let's do the, uh, the oocyte freezing in this particular case. And there is no difference in survival between uh, patients that they have uh, ovarian stimulation versus those that do not have uh, ovarian stimulation. So the fertility preservation drugs does not impact on the survival in breast cancer patient. And uh, even if uh, it is a patient that has an uh, estrogen receptor uh, uh, negative group or positive group, that's important info. So uh, if there is really no time or the patient wants to freeze just a few uh, more eggs than what we can do in one cycle, the classical example, patient comes, oh, I need to start chemotherapy in two, and, and, we, and we got two weeks time, how many times can I stimulate her? Probably only one time, right? So one time means what? Probably 10, 12 eggs, which probably means if she has a, a partner, probably one or two blastocysts. If she has a, but then I'm going to become sterile. And what's my chance of having a baby with the one or two blastocysts? Well, if you are younger than 35, your chance is 50, 50, 50%. 50 mm. Maybe I want to do more. Okay, then if you want to do more, we can do a combined approach. We can take some eggs, but then I can also take a, a cortex, a piece of ovarian tissue, because in the cortex of uh, the ovarian tissue, there are thousands of eggs. And then we can freeze that with the understanding that there is no metastasis in the, in the ovary. And then once you are cured from cancer, I can retransplant the ovarian tissue back to you. And this is uh, in order to do the ovarian tissue uh, harvest. And uh, we need to have uh, an OK from you again, from the pathologist that says that there are no biopsies uh, positive when we do the sampling of, uh, of the ovarian tissue prior to freezing. So we will not offer ovarian, we will not offer ovarian tissue freezing to patients with the leukemia because this is the most uh, um, common uh, metastasized uh, uh, cancer to the ovary. But we can certainly do it in the breast cancer stage one and two. And these are the type of cancer we can certainly offer ovarian tissue freezing. And here it's still a little bit of a gray, um, a gray line whether we should or we should not for breast cancer stage four. That's the ovarian tissue that is harvested. Here is a picture of, uh, uh, from a Dr. Azzodi case that he took a piece of ovarian tissue and sent it to us for freezing. And uh, the literature is now abundant in uh, this type of processes. And uh, if you ask, okay, how successful it is, these are the most, this the most comprehensive review. 80 women had an ovarian tissue transplanted, 20 of them conceived, some with IVF, some spontaneously, so for an efficiency of about 25%. Uh, and also a very recent case of a girl that had the, an entire ovary removed at age 14. She had just started puberty but did not have the menses yet, so they took an entire ovary because she was undergoing um, a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. But then, so they, they cut the ovary in strips, about 62. At age 25, so 11 years later, she had the four strips transplanted because now she became um, uh, menopausal. And then uh, she had the pregnancy and delivery at age 27 of an healthy boy. So would this tissue not have been frozen she would not be able to have uh, her, own, her own child. And for the leukemia, uh, these are the most tricky ones. That's why we are trying to uh, do some research uh, at Yale. We are trying to do in vitro folliculogenesis, collaboration with uh, Sweden to do in vitro all ovary perfusion, <coughs> collaboration with uh, Edinburgh to do artificial follicles. So those are uh, research projects. So this is really the summary slides, fertility preservation in women with the cancer, what can we do? If I get the referral, the ovarian involvement is unlikely. Chemo cannot be delayed. You, do, you don't give me the 10, 12 days. The only option is ovarian cryopreservation. If you give me the two weeks time, 
I can do embryo or outside freezing depending on the, on the status of the couple or, or the patient. And I can also add ovarian cryo if the patient wants more than uh, 10, 12 eggs to be uh, cryopreserved. If the ovarian tissue, uh, ovarian involvement is likely, the only option is, uh, uh, of course, if ovarian involvement is likely, if I can do ovarian uh, uh, stimulation and take, uh, and take eggs, that will be the best thing to do. But if I don't have that two weeks time, yes, I can take the tissue, but then I cannot retransplant and I need to try to figure out something to do in vitro and try to get eggs from that place. If you are really interested in fertility preservation and you are excited from what I said to you in uh, English, in Italian, and uh, wherever I said, please join us in Shanghai. There is the fourth World Congress of uh, uh, the International Society of Fertility Preservation of him, uh, that I'm serving as a president for the next two years, and you will see and you will hear much more uh, exciting news. Thank you for your time.